Facebook is full of dead people. What we learn from this week's congressional hearings, phone fubbing, Alexa listening, and everything we know so far about the arrest of Julian Assange. All that and more coming up on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 78, recorded Thursday, April 11th, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by FreshBooks, the ridiculously easy-to-use invoicing and accounting software. If you don't believe us, try it for free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash TNW. And by Peak PTT, the leading provider of push-to-talk systems for business communications. For instant, always-on nationwide communications, visit peakptt.com and use the promo code TWIT for 15% off. And by Gazelle, the trusted online marketplace for buying and selling used devices. Visit gazelle.com slash TWIT to buy a certified pre-owned device and get 10% off your purchase. Hello, welcome to Tech News Weekly. This is a show where every week we talk to people making and breaking the tech news. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Hell. Welcome back. Oh, thank you. Um, and I'll not see you next week. No, thank you for <laughs> welcome doing- Welcome back and see you later. Yes, yes. <laughs> We're the team's together for one yeah. week and then you're going on vacation. That's well right. Deserved. That's right. Shall we go? Let's do it. Let's do it. So you found a guardian for your kids, a beneficiary for your life insurance, and a home for your rare comic book collection after you die- but have you given any thought to who's going to manage your Facebook page? Louise Mistakis has. She recently reported on some new features for dead people on Facebook, and she's here to talk about them. Welcome back to the show, Louise. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for having me. So back in 2015, Facebook announced the ability to add a legacy contact. Let's talk first a little bit about what that is. So basically, it's someone to be the guardian of your Facebook when you die, right? So the idea is... Uh, can um, they can't delete anything? They can't, uh, you know, look at your direct messages, but they can change your profile picture. They can change your cover photo, and they can kind of write a pin post that is like, "Hey, this is where Louise's funeral is," or whatever that sort of thing. So it's you know, if you had a joke as your profile image, and then you pass away, it allows a family member to change it, you know, to have some control and and kind of tell people what's going on. But they can't go in and respond to your direct messages or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. So they can't change anything. They can't delete anything that you've uploaded, but they can kind of change a couple of things so that it, it you know, is in a place where people who are grieving or people who are coming to your profile to remember you, it, it, it's in a more reasonable state for that. Now, there are those things that they cannot change. Do they have full access in that regard to things like the, the private messages or anything like that? Or is that completely blocked off to, to those people managing the accounts at that point? Not. They have absolutely no access. And that's kind of a hard line that Facebook has always drawn, which is that, you know, they're balancing the privacy of the person who's passed away with the uh, family members. So they really don't want you to read any of those private messages. And that's that's totally against their terms of service, no matter what. Hmm. So Facebook recently made some changes. Talk a little bit about the changes they made to what the legacy um, contact can now do that they couldn't do before. So one of the biggest things is that they can manage a new tribute section, which is a place for people to come and share memories of the loved one. So what Facebook realized is that people were doing this on the person's wall, and it didn't really make sense because those messages were showing up right above the things that they might have posted and shared while they were still alive. So this is kind of a different dedicated timeline. And the other thing about that timeline is that the legacy contact can manage it. So they can... Uh, prevent people from being able to see those messages. They can also, uh, they can moderate who is allowed to post there. So that makes a lot of sense, right? right? Like someone's parent might not be ready to see all those messages. So the legacy contact can say, hey, we're going to kind of hide those messages from mom for now. Or, you know, this family member is really not expressing their grief in a way that's fair to everyone else. We're going to kind of exclude them from posting on the tribute section for a little bit. So instead of having it kind of be a free for all where the legacy Legacy can't control anything. The tribute section will have a little bit of moderation and it will be separate from the original person's timeline. So it seemed like on Monday, Facebook had a, a couple of announcements around this, uh, you know, around these uh, 
issues that that pertain to someone passing away, legacy account, obviously who manages the account. I know one thing that I've heard about time and time again is this this situation where let's say someone passes away and then someone who knows them really well, be it their significant significant other or someone who's really close to them, you know, it's like their birthday comes up and it appears as if they're still alive or you're creating an event and, and suddenly, you know, it, it suggests that you add this person, but that person's not alive. What is Facebook doing around that? Because I know that can actually, that can be very upsetting to someone uh, to suddenly see that name time and time again posed in a way as if they are still alive when the person obviously knows that they are not. Yeah, so Facebook's kind of vague about this, but they said that they're going to be using artificial intelligence to make that happen less. And one of the reasons that that can happen is that the account is not memorialized. So an account becomes memorialized, it basically becomes frozen and when Facebook uh, is notified and they verify that the person has actually passed away. But that process can be um, traumatic and it's not always something that every family member is ready for. So previously, this is another change they made is that anyone could memorialize uh, a profile. So, you know, someone could say, hey, Louise is dead. Here's this news story. And Facebook is like, okay, we're going to memorialize it before, you know, a parent or a significant other or a sibling is actually aware that that's happening. So now Facebook is only going to let a family member or a, uh, you know, close friend do that. But yeah, it, it's a really interesting problem that you would go uh, to, you know, make a birthday party and you'd see your dead sibling as someone that you should invite. So Facebook says they're using AI to make that happen less. They're pretty vague about what those exact mechanisms were, but it kind of shows this uh, really strange dynamic, which what happens when uh, there's a lot of dead people on Facebook, right? Or on any social network and these profiles don't go away and Facebook kind of has to figure out how to fit them into the platform when it can be traumatic for them to be shown, you know, shown up in these places. There should be like a cremating option, like just disappear, you know, like That's I don't like delete the account. Right. Right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but they didn't offer that. You can, yeah. you can actually. So if you put that in your will, Facebook will honor that. If you tell your legacy contact that that's what you want to happen, that, that is possible for that to be uh, you know, if you, your digital garden, your will is like, please delete my Facebook. Facebook will honor that. But a lot of people don't think about it. So there isn't really an option. And if there's no, you know, written wishes, then Facebook kind of has to uh, balance these interests. Like maybe your best friend says, hey, you know, she hated Facebook. She wants her Facebook deleted. But the, the parents say, hey, like that's an important memory for us. So it is a really difficult uh, issue. Sure. And I know we're going to find out that like those accounts aren't really deleted, even if you said and like a year from now, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, Facebook is using dead people's accounts that they said they deleted to um, advertise to all their friends or something like that. I'm sure that will happen. I'm not saying it, did, but I know that something like that. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so what I, I know someone in our chat room is saying, um, you know, that they have a friend whose father died and that person's wife keeps posting on his behalf and it's weird. So we should say that lots of people, you know, among their their partners partners will give them their, their passwords. Like I know, and even LastPass has an option that you can, like, if you're not alive anymore, you, your, your LastPass account, LastPass is a sponsor of ours, but your LastPass account automatically goes to your partner. So there may be lots of people just doing this on their own and posting, maybe not even knowing that you can do that, but posting on behalf because they have the person's password. Yeah. And I think what Facebook is doing by giving more power to the legacy contact is to discourage that. But you've seen a lot of situations where, you know, the person dies in a car accident, the wife gets the person's phone, they're still logged in and they have control over the account. And then the page gets memorialized and all of a sudden they're kicked out of the account and they don't have an access anymore and they didn't get to save anything. So there are a lot of weird issues. But for sure, that comes up a lot, especially when, um, there's a suicide or where the person maybe died because of a crime. There's a lot of interest in preserving the account and preserving the password, um, which is really difficult. And I think, yeah, it's definitely an issue that people are logging into these accounts and it's something that Facebook definitely wants to discourage by having, you know, allowing someone like that wife to have more control over a dedicated section rather than like, you know, posting as, as his status or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you spoke to Sheryl Sandberg, um, this Facebook COO, uh, about what would happen if say like, you know, my husband is my um, Facebook legacy contact and we both died in a car accident or something at the same time. Um, what did she say to that question? Yeah, so this was really surprising to me because I thought that this was a pretty common issue. So I just brought it up because it's 
seemed like one of the main problems that they weren't addressing. And Cheryl seemed genuinely really surprised by that. Uh, and she said it was something that they were going to look into. But yeah, I was uh, honestly really shocked by uh, her kind of startled response. Uh, but I hope it's something that they look into because I'm sure that it can't be that uncommon. You know, it's something that people have to consider when they're buying life insurance, right? It's really not that uncommon of a problem. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. It's just very... Um you know, emblematic of like, oh, really? We never thought of that. Well, there's a lot they hadn't thought of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to help. You know? <laughs> uh, Louise, thank you so much for joining us. Louise Mitsakis is a staff writer at Wired and you can find her piece. Uh, it is called Facebook Rolls Out More Features for Dead People. You can find that on wired.com. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Louise. Thanks. Have a good rest of your day. All right, you too. Thank Talk you. to you soon. Coming up, another week for big tech in Washington, and it was about as counterproductive as it's ever been. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by FreshBooks, accounting software that focuses on smart and informed decision making and it makes it easy to shine a light on the health of your business. From kickoff to billing, FreshBooks actually supports your business every step of the way. Uh, and you can actually give them a try for free Today, right away, FreshBooks self-employed accounting software is ridiculously easy to use. It's set up to be easy to use. You can create and customize invoices. You can log every hour with time tracking. Uh, it has easy to understand reports, payment scheduling, properly categorize uh, expenses to make filing taxes at Breeze. And right now it's tax time. So I'm sure you could you know, work towards a, an easier tax time next year. As a hardworking small business owner, you're constantly evolving to keep up with your customer and industry demands. So you can let FreshBooks uh, grow with you. No more digging out the checkbook or fumbling with paper invoices. Uh, introducing automated clearinghouse ACH payments also known as bank transfers. ACH is a network that connects all financial institutions across the U.S., so you're going to get paid two times faster. It's ideal for large invoices. Uh, you've got a low 1% transaction fee, and you can keep your finger on the pulse of your small business wherever you happen to be. Uh, FreshBooks does have a mobile app, of course, so you can snap photos of your receipts, create and send invoices, chat with clients, manage all of your expenses, Everything's embedded in there and it's super easy to use. So don't wait another day and join over 24 million people who have used FreshBooks. Visit freshbooks.com slash TNW. Make sure and enter Tech News Weekly in the How Did You Hear About Us section and you'll receive 30 days free. That's freshbooks.com slash TNW and enter Tech News Weekly to receive 30 days free. And we thank FreshBooks for their support. Big tech has been on the mind at Capitol Hill this week as the House Judiciary Committee has held hearings on hate crimes and the rise of white nationalism. As you can imagine, it has been complicated, to say the least. Joining us to talk about the hearings is Tony Rome from The Washington Post. Welcome back to the show, Tony. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to have you back. It's been a while. So uh, you've been at the hearings this week would you say, like being in the room, has the tenor in the room been that of finding a deeper understanding, reaching a deeper <laughs> understanding, or has this, like previous congressional hearings on similar topics, felt more like kind of confusion of of the issue at hand? Yeah, I think it was a mix of both. And, and and there were two hearings this week. The first came from the House Judiciary Committee, led by Democrats, where lawmakers convened to explore the spread and the rise of white nationalism, particularly on social media like Facebook and Twitter. And then the next day, we saw a hearing in front of the Republican-led Senate Judiciary Committee, which focused on allegations that social media sites are biased against conservatives. Those are two very different hearings, but they reflect a similar sentiment among Democrats and Republicans that these companies haven't found the right balance over the right content to allow and the content to block uh, on their social networking sites. So at times we heard some legitimate issues. Uh, Democrats raised, for example, that many of the attacks that we've seen globally over the past year or two uh, have some sort of connection with social media as the attackers posted very hateful screeds online before they carried out some of that violence. Uh, but we also saw a lot of politics and that was the case of the Senate hearing where Republicans say that Tech companies are biased against conservatives, despite not having an overwhelming amount of evidence uh, of all that. But I think the, the big takeaway here is that we could see a continued push for regulation of these social media giants coming from, from both days on Capitol Hill. Wow, yeah, it really spreads the gap. And, and it was interesting on Tuesday, you know, YouTube, of course, was streaming 
streaming the event and as you say you know they were they were talking about white nationalism and how this spreads through social media and yet here you have the youtube chat uh, kind of being overcome overridden and at, at a certain point being closed off entirely because it was being overrun by these things indicative would you say I, I imagine of a larger problem of the greater issue here which is that it's really difficult to police these uh, social media sites for the people running them to kind of tamp down on some of this you know, some of these behaviors yeah it was very illustrative of the problem at hand i mean on one hand you had jerry nadler who's the top democrat on the house judiciary committee listing off a series of instances in which white extremist content online or anti-semitic content online had resulted in real world harm and literally side by side you had youtube users anonymous youtube users who were posting extremist racist anti-semitic comment on the site it was it was the greatest illustration we've seen to date of the exact problem these lawmakers uh, we're trying to explore and it actually led Congressman Nadler to point this out during the hearing to say it's exactly why lawmakers are gathered. But I think the reason there's frustration on Capitol Hill is because this is such a very easy problem to the naked eye to fix. It's people posting very obviously racist and extremist content. It's in the light of day, it's on a public facing website. These companies are multi-billion dollar international tech behemoths that talk up the power of their artificial intelligence tools, but yet they can't stop hate speech around a hearing on hate speech. So I think it's just kind of read off to lawmakers, uh, you know, an example that these companies haven't really figured out the right balance and aren't doing enough to stop harmful content online. Well, Tony, you've been, uh, you've been doing awesome coverage as you always do. We love getting you on the show. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, you can follow Tony. Tony Arum's work at the Washington Post, WashingtonPost.com, of course. And uh, we'll check in on you next time. Tony, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Take thank care. You. After the break, are smartphones systematically dismantling all our most important relationships? We'll find out. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Peak PTT, the leading provider of push to talk systems for business communications. Company cell phones are not only expensive, but they can also be huge time wasters for employees. You know what I'm talking about, whatever um, you app, all those apps that we love. Um, it's not so great when your employees are spending all their time on that instead of using those as communication tools as you intended. You can boost productivity and cut down costs today with peak. PTT. Peak provides advanced IP-based push-to-talk systems for small, medium, and enterprise businesses. Leverage the internet, cellular data, and Wi-Fi networks to transmit voice over the internet. They provide instant talk, location monitoring, and emergency alert notifications. Local, nationwide, and worldwide coverage. Rugged devices. They're uh, made to withstand dirt, water, and extreme temperatures. There's no contract, and billing is month to month. Less than one second connection time. Hello, Burke. Can you hear me? No. Roger that. No diesel bears. <laughs> no diesel bears? <laughs> Burke, okay. Burke is literally five feet away from yeah, Megan. So. But, uh, <laughs> so they have central tracking and communication center from any PC, real-time GPS tracking for accurate and complete visibility. The K2 PTT system is ideal for small and medium-sized businesses. The system includes an affordable walkie-talkie style handset. That's what we're using right now, PTT 84G. Uh, there are iOS and Android apps and PC dispatch software for device location tracking. The Everest PTT system is capable of deployments of any size. This includes the PTT 584G rugged handset, five nines of network availability. They also have lower latency rates than some of the most significant players in the industry. PC-based dispatch console to locate devices on demand and view on a map. Push to talk calls last an average of 15 seconds versus 50 seconds for traditional calls. Get in touch faster and operate more efficiently with Peak PTT. Visit peakptt.com and use promo code TWIT at checkout for 15% off. That's peakptt.com and use promo code TWIT at checkout for 15% off. And we thank Peak PTT for their support. Over. <laughs> <laughs> According to a new Gallup poll, 61% of people polled believe that they use their phone less 
than the people around them. That's 61% of people believe that they use their phone less than people around them. That's not a, that's not mathematically possible. So not only are we using our phones around others too much, apparently we don't even know or we can't admit to ourselves that we're doing it. Joining us to talk about this is Angela Lashbrook, columnist at One Zero, Medium's new tech and science pu publication. Welcome to the show, Angela. Hey, thanks for having me. So there are a few, lo there, there are not that many longitudinal studies about the effects of smartphone use like over a long period of time, but there is growing research about how our sm smartphone um, can just, using it can generally make us feel bad. Tell us first about the study that looked at the effect of smartphones on relationships between strangers. Yeah, um, so basically people when they're using their, their phones in the presence of strangers smile less at at each other, um, there's just less sense of connection and um, less smiling, which is, I mean, kind of depressing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you also introduced me to a, a term um, that I had never heard, uh, fubbing, like P-H-U-B-B. -B. <laughs> Tell us what that is. Yeah, so fubbing means phone snubbing. I hadn't heard it before either. Um, I, I think I think researchers invented it just to like give like a cool name to this phenomenon. But um, now I've started using it in regular conversations as well. <laughs> and and to which people go, huh? What, what what is that word? Is that is that a bad word? Uh, the Gallup poll shows that most people think they use their phone less than anyone that's around them, but. In reality, in my case, it's true. Am I part of the problem? <laughs> I wouldn't consider you part of the problem, but I think you're lying to yourself. <laughs> probably. Probably, yeah. So I'm part of my own problem. I don't is. think, I don't, you don't usually use your, you know what you do do? What? You talk to, we share an office and you talk to your Google assistant a lot. And I think you're talking to me. And there needs oh. to be a word. Like, you're just like, remind me to get the laundry. I was like, I'm not going to remind you to get the laundry. <laughs> so and I don't use the hey, Megan keyword. Yeah, beforehand. exactly. You don't. Um, so is this part of our expectations? Like, just we expect to people to respond right away. Is that part of the problem? I haven't seen any research that looks at why we fub. I think part of the problem is just that it's habitual. Like we're just constantly on our phones. We're used to being on our phones. So uh, it's the term addiction. Uh, researchers don't often like to use that term because re addiction does mean something specific, but um, we are kind of addicted to our phones and that's what's getting in the, in the way of our face-to-face -face interactions. Um, some might argue that this is uh, somewhat of a, a generational issue in that, you know, maybe older generations are more sensitive to this. Younger generations might not care as much. But from what you've seen in the Gallup poll and everything, is that true? I mean, you know, I guess it's easy to lump, you know, like take millennials as one example who have grown up largely with this kind of technology as much more of a force in their entire lives than someone my age in my 40s where it kind of came in in the last half of my life. And so I've seen both sides. But does that does that evidence bear out at all? Or is this something that everybody um, finds dissatisfaction in? I think it's something that everyone has issues with. I think older people are more offended by people fubbing them, but I haven't seen evidence, and I could be wrong, but I haven't seen evidence that older people fub less. And um, judging by, you know, my parents, love you guys, um, <laughs> but they fub, they fub me. So <laughs> I think definitely older people do the same. They just take it more personally when others do it to them. Uh, I see. Well, I mean, yeah. as a, you know, just a, from personal experience, I'm a family of five. I have three teenagers and every one of us, it's the same. We all get equally offended. Like I, I get offended um, when my kids are using their phones, um, when I want them to pay attention to me and they get offended when I use my phone and they want me to pay attention. So it's this weird kind of um, cognitive dissonance or dissonance because like I know that it's offensive, but yet I still do it. Um, are there any tips? I mean, are there any, wh what's the... Solve this problem for us, Angela. What do we do? <laughs> I mean, I think the I I, 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 I um, concluded my piece with this, and I think it's pretty simple. You just need to like put your phone away, uh, and that's easier said than done. I realize, but when you look at like how it impacts, like you, you brought up your kids, it your kids notice and they like take that with them, and then you're also end up 
finding less meaning when you spend time with your kids. And that's like why so many of us have kids is because it gives our lives meaning. So I think it's just like realizing the impact and then putting your phone on silent in a way when you're with them. Yeah. Gaining awareness around that. You also mentioned though, in your piece, like I know sometimes when I go out to dinner, you know, my wife and I go out, out to dinner, sometimes I have the phone on the table at the, where we're at, but I have a screen down. It's like, that's like mm-hmm. a halfway step. It's like the phone's but there. Why? We both see it. Uh, and I think in my head I have that. And, and I would imagine I'm guessing my wife would probably agree is that, you know, we have two young kids, they're home with a babysitter. So I feel like, I feel like the the point of contact in case there's an issue or an emergency has to be there somehow. And if it's in my pocket, I'm, I'm, possibly going to miss that. So it ends up on the table, but that sends what you're writing in the pieces. Even that right there sends some sort of a signal. It sends the signal that I'm not 100% dialed in or connected with my wife at that point. Right. I mean, obviously if you're concerned about like your kids at home without you, maybe it's worth fubbing your wife for that reason. (laughs) But, uh, but yeah, mutual fubbing. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, so there was one piece, one part of your piece that really struck me that there was a study that shows having, uh, your phone out in a social situation might, did lead to some good in terms of like anxiety. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so if you are going into a social situation and you feel anxious about the situation, if you have your phone with you, but not in use, you were more likely to feel less anxious than if you didn't have your phone at all or if you were using your phone actively. So there is like some benefit to having that phone near you when you're feeling nervous. But um, but yeah, don't use it because that will make you feel worse. I'm curious if you have any any solutions to this problem is that Obviously, using our phones uh, when we're with someone else pulls us out of the situation, uh, out of our connection with them. It, it, you know, it, it puts a little bit of a, a glass and metal wall between the two of you when, when you pull out a phone. Yet we use our phone for so many things, one of those being taking pictures, which many people would say, you know, if it wasn't part of a phone, if you just had a camera that you were pulling out, that wouldn't necessarily be a disconnection of the relationship between the two people. Right. That would be kind of symboli- or, you know, symbolizing that, that moment uh, with each other. But now that's part of the phone itself. Is there some uh, like confusion there as far as how that, how that translates into the, the lack of connection? So, so what some of the researchers told me is that the phone use that you your phone use when you're with someone else should be useful to that other person. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking photos of that other person, you're taking photos of the food or whatever that communicates that you're engaged with them in that situation. Whereas if you were just scrolling Twitter, you would, you would be sending a signal that you're not engaged. Basically, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but someone said something like, the phone use needs to provide value in that moment to both of you. So that's how I would put it. Is the phone providing value to the other person? If not, then you should put it away. Yeah, like that. And it's, so, it's hard because our phone is so much. I mean, I found just recently I deleted um, the Twitter app from my phone and I deleted the Poshmark app from my phone, both which were <laughs> um, addictions. I, I, your giggling makes me believe you know what Poshmark is. Not everyone does. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can sell and buy clothes. And it's a good app and it's great to like reuse things and everything. But I found that there was so much mindless scrolling, scrolling and it was so shocking to me because since I did that, I, my battery life in my phone, like literally would not go through the day, but now it, I go, you know, it's like 75%. And I'm sure that nice. maybe like those apps were pulling battery life, but I was just using them so much. So I think if you can't just, if like saying put away your phone is too hard, I just think they're pro- it's a good idea to look at some apps that might, you might be spending too much time on. That's my personal. Yeah. I need to delete Instagram. That's my next step. Yeah. (laughs) Well, yeah, I couldn't do that. I just moved it off the front page. That's, that's my life hack. Move it off the front page of your, um, your phone. Angela, thank you so much for joining us. Angela Lashbrook is a columnist at one zero on medium. She's previously written for the outline, the Atlantic and Vox.com. She is lemon sand on Twitter and uh, go to one zero, check out her latest piece about how the next wellness trend should be Google spreadsheets. This is a good one. Um, I agree, by the way. (laughs) Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care.
Okay, really, is your smart home assistant actually filled with people listening to your every word? We're yes, talk about little that. tiny people. Yeah, little <laughs> tiny people in there. But first, we'll talk about that in a second. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Gazelle, the trusted online marketplace for buying certified pre-owned devices. You've set your creative and professional goals for this year, uh, but do you have the right tools to tackle them? It's time to upgrade your devices, and you can do that with Gazelle. Devices are in fair, good, or excellent condition, and all at great prices. Everything from iPhone 6 through 10 to a variety of Samsung Galaxy phones. They also offer MacBooks, both Air and Pro, and then also iPads, standard Air and Pro. Each device goes through a thorough 30-point inspection. Devices are backed by a 30-day return policy, no restocking fee, and free shipping. All of their products are sold without a carrier contract and are available for support by major carriers or unlocked. And also, if you need financing, financing is available on all devices with a firm. Uh, you can get instantly approved payoff in three, six, or 12 months. So you're not signing your life away. Uh, you just select financing with a firm at checkout. With Gazelle's incredible selection of quality pre-owned devices, they're also an excellent choice for students. Uh, so if you don't know what to do with your old devices, you know, I know for, for myself, I go through a lot of devices and they end up in a drawer. And it's like, I don't know what to do with these. I want to donate them. Do I want to sell them? What do I want to do? Check out Gazelle for competitive offers on your used phones, tablets, and computers and put them to use again, right? Like put them in somebody's hands that's actually going to do something with them. Level up this year with new tech from Gazelle. Visit gazelle.com slash twit and you can buy a certified pre-owned device and get 10% off your purchase. That's gazelle.com slash twit. And we thank Gazelle for their support of Tech News Weekly. We've become so accustomed to those talking smart home hubs in our homes uh, those of us who have allowed them in anyways, it's almost as if there's a real person in there. The Google Assistant answers questions. Amazon's voice assistant tells us the weather. They're like little robot friends. Well, Bloomberg has a report out today that says that thousands of Amazon employees are actually tasked with listening to voice recordings from Echo devices around the world in order to transcribe, annotate, and then upload them back into the software to improve things. This is all done to improve the accuracy of the voice transcription and sort of fill in the holes left behind by the devices because nothing's perfect, of course. Uh, but this is sure to stir the, the privacy feathers of concerned users, and especially those who have been saying all along, oh, hell no, I'm not bringing one of those into my home to listen to me all day and night. Uh, it turns out, you know, that people have often, you know, their pushback on this is, yeah, well, once there's an always listening device in my home, then, you know, what is it going to pick up? Is it always picking up just when I give the, you know, give the proper uh, wake word or, you know, as we know, inadvertently it wakes up throughout the time. I know if I logged into my Google account, there's a ton of recordings that, you know, that have been issued as assistant commands. Not all of them were intentional, yet there they are. And in the case of Amazon anyways, and I, honestly, I wouldn't be very surprised at all if Google does this also, uh, there are actually people listening to a very small percentage of these. But when you're talking about the amount of devices worldwide, even a small percentage is a lot of recordings. So potentially a lot of people. Yeah, it's one of those things where like we've literally, I have said this, like it's not like someone's sitting around Amazon listening to your conversations. <laughs> But, uh, you know, who do you know? They yeah, are. They are. Um, it is, uh, it's disturbing. And it's also like, I. it's like, oh, well, obviously this doesn't really surprise me that much. Right. Um, you know, we've, I've even done a segment on how you can delete your recordings because they're all there. You, they don't let you do it from the app. You have to go to the Amazon website and go and log in. They do not make it easy and you can go through and delete them. And um, some people have done that and noticed that it's even like work, their Amazon Echo is uh, better because I don't know why, but maybe just like getting rid of all the- um, The cruft. Yeah, the cruft, exactly. <laughs> makes it um, listening. But this is really disturbing. They had chat rooms. These people listening had chat rooms where they would send around funny stuff like a funny recording i mean if i've listened to my amazon things and it's embarrassing like the things i ask for or just when mm -hmm. it picks up stuff that it doesn't um didn't you know when i didn't i had no idea it was listening also they said that people heard like things that they thought maybe it was a sexual assault going on or something and they were t amazon told them don't do anything about it. We don't, you know, we can't get involved, which at one point is like, oh, you know, that's a terrible place to be. 
terrible place to be for the worker, right? Yeah. And then you can, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm- Or the person being assaulted. <clears throat> well, absolutely. Well, yeah. no. Well, yes. Yeah, okay. Terrible yeah. all around, yeah. of course. Right. Um, but then, of course, there's Amazon thinking about their own liability, right? Mm -hmm. This is never anything that they've put out in the public to say, oh yeah, so by the way, we have people, you know, actually humans listening to your recordings. Mm -hmm. It's not something they have in the terms of service. Pro I mean, arguably it probably should be, but it's probably not something that people actually think is happening. Yet when you take a look at how this technology is developed, like it, to a certain degree, it makes sense, right? Like we tend to uh, hail AI as like the solution to every every world problem that there is, and AI will solve the problem. Uh, there's still humans that created the AI, and AI still makes mistakes, and sometimes the best way to correct those mistakes that a computer is making is to have a human look at it and go, oh, that's not saying that word, that's saying this other word. And for whatever reason, I as a human can determine that, but a computer has a hard time determining that through the microphone. Um, so I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it puts it puts the workers in an, un, in an uncomfortable position. At the same time, I'm, I'm kind of not surprised that they do this. And like I said, I'd be very surprised if Google didn't also mm -hmm. do this because they have to, from their perspective, they have to improve their technology somehow. And this is one effective way to do that. Yeah. It's just privacy wise, uh, the implications are just strange, especially when they don't tell you about it. Right, exactly. They say, I mean, they say that they listen to your conversations to make, um, I can't remember what the exact words, but it, it was um, to, to, to improve them. You know, Amazon says we mm -hmm. use we use these recordings to get a better understanding of what you're saying. Um, so, but I think it's just like, I personally never wanted to take that next step to imagine somebody in a chat room saying like, did you hear what that? Oh, that, I know, You right. know, yeah, with the, that argument she had with her husband. <laughs> Woo, glad I'm not him. Yeah. You know, which I'm sure they're doing, but I just didn't want to imagine it. And now I have to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, take take solace in the fact. That, I mean, I imagine that it's that it's anonymized. I didn't read in there whether it actually was, but I'd be really surprised if it wasn't. Yeah, right. I'm because because they could be sharing some really, uh, really specific information, bank account numbers, right. you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I hope that they're anonymized. I mean, that. I'm guessing it's anonymized, but if you figured out that you were listening to like um, John Legend and you know hit, uh, his <laughs> oh, John Echo, Legend just talking about would, Google, that would sure end up in the chat room. Like, listen yeah. to what they're talking about. That'd be saved. Yeah, that'd be saved to a hard drive, <laughs> exactly. probably. So yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned this, but this was all sources that didn't want to speak on the record. Yeah, um, but it's Bloomberg, so um, you know they. They had signed an NDA, so um, I have no reason not to believe that this mm -hmm. is true. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it'll make it makes it, it'll make you think twice. You know what I mean? It's it's easy to think of these home assistants, and I know I'm totally guilty of it. Being like, ah, there's no, there's no there there. It's just a mm -hmm. device, and you know there there are always the the really privacy minded people have been saying from the beginning, like, why would you be crazy? So crazy is to bring one of those into your home. Uh, only bad news, maybe long term, maybe we're still in the short term and the mm -hmm. long term ramification is this is the beginning of something big, bigger, you know, like a, an example of a million little cuts. This mm -hmm. is just one of those little cuts. Maybe it grows to something bigger, but it's impossible to know. But mm -hmm. something to, to consider about those mm -hmm. devices. Breaking news this morning, Thursday, uh, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. Assange was removed uh, from the Ecuadorian embassy in London and the U.S. Department of Justice unsealed charges that Assange helped Chelsea Manning acquire U.S. Sec secrets. Oh, some people are saying that Assange's arrest is a violation of the First Amendment and he was uh, just doing his job as a journalist. Um, at issue also is uh, really the heart of this issue is whether Assange asked Manning to do what she did or simply encouraged her. Um, there's some text about, you know, there, there were these um, hacked, these passwords that um, they have notes of what he said about getting those passwords. So it's, um, yeah, it's obviously a continuing story, um, but the indictment says Assange conspired to assist Manning in cracking a password. And uh, that's what they'll have to figure out. Right. And, you know, and this uh, 
complicated for a number of reasons, right? Uh, is WikiLeaks a journalist organization or is it a wing of the, the Russian government uh, informational intelligence uh, aspect of things? Was the information that Assange exposed a threat to national security or was it simply evidence of wrongdoing? And, you know, and the U.S. doesn't like that, doesn't like the fact that evidence of wrongdoing was exposed. Um, he's also, you know, Part of this is the fact that he skipped bail on a sexual assault case. And so that, you know, that's another kind of convenient, convenient reason uh, along along with, you know, the, the the Mueller report timing. There's just all these things coming coming together. When I think of, of Assange and I and I always see everybody has very specific, specific, deep rooted feelings as far as whether what he did was right or what he did was wrong, whether he should be extradited or whether he should be, you know, relieved of all charges and everything. And I find myself, unfortunately, I find myself so still in the mist on this, always trying to figure it out because I, I see both sides. Like I can, I can understand both sides of the argument and I really don't know how I feel about it. But if, if it comes down on a journalistic side of things, uh, he shouldn't be extradited, right? Because he would be a journalist, uh, you know, reporting. But what what he's charged with here isn't necessarily just reporting information. He's charged with actually, you know, conspiring, actually being involved in extracting uh, this information. And does that make it less of a journalistic move and more of like an activist move? I don't know. It, it The whole thing is, is rather confusing to me, but th this is a big day, obviously, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2012, this, this guy's been holed up for years and you can tell in his beard. <laughs> yes, you can, you can tell it in his beard. You can, you can see it in his beard. A good point. Um, there it is. There's the beard I mean, again. It's, yeah, all things aside, it's it's a pretty epic uh, epic look he's got going right now. Yeah. Uh, um, anyways. So, yeah, the, I'm sure that Leo's going to talk about this on Twit. For sure. um, he'll be back to talk about it um, at length. And, uh, yeah, so we'll be following the story as well. That's right. Leo will be fresh back from Hawaii. His beard, Re I hope, yeah, his, like Hopefully that. he has an epic <laughs> yes. beard as well yes. uh, to show off. Um, we'll see. You'll have to tune into Twit to see. <laughs> Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us tnw at twit.tv. Subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash tnw. Um, you, know, you can also listen or watch right on the web, too, through um, Apple Podcasts now. You can go right on the web. You don't even, you know, just watch straight from there. But you can also watch it twit.tv slash tnw you can watch straight on the web there so either way wherever we don't care where you watch We're it all over the we web we just basically. want you to watch it yeah. um and if you want to tweet at me i'm at megan maroney and i'm at jason howell thanks to the johns thanks to burke thanks to alex thanks to you for watching we'll see you all next week well megan will i won't see you i'll be on vacation uh anyways next week's tech news weekly happens next thursday so join megan then bye everybody